So good morning, everyone. I'm Larissa Bizo, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Canadian Bureau for International Education, and it brings me great pleasure to open up this morning's panel conversation, part two in our two-part series on inclusive and sustainable internationalization in Canada. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Gotham Kaluri and CIP Study Abroad for supporting today's panel. Without the support of companies like CIP Study Abroad, we would not be able to offer such a rich virtual program. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce our panel who will be continuing yesterday's conversation. It's hard to imagine, we could probably continue this conversation for days, uh, but we're hoping to in this compressed hour and a bit, um, share with you uh, the continuation of yesterday's conversation. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce Tarek Fancy, Andrew Gordon, Ashley Richard, CJ Tremblay, Ankit Tripathi, and our co-moderators, Denise O'Neill-Green and Andra Saluji. Denise is the Vice President of Equity and Community Inclusion at Ryerson University, and Anver, both a CBIE board member, as well as Assistant Vice President International at Ryerson University. So I invite you, Denise, Anver, and our panelists to turn on your cameras, and over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Larissa, and a uh, warm welcome to everyone, uh, including our five panelists. As Larissa indicated, uh, this panel discussion charting the uh, path towards inclusive and sustainable internationalization in Canada in a post-COVID-19 world is the second part uh, of the discussion that began uh, yesterday, uh, which was an amazing discussion and I expect uh, that today's will be as well. Uh, a, a few housekeeping remarks with respect to the agenda. I'll make a few uh, opening remarks, uh, introduce our first two speakers, and then I will turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Denise O'Neill Green, who will uh, in turn make a few remarks and introduce our remaining three panelists. Each panelist will have uh, three minutes to speak, and then we'll turn it to uh, uh, over back to Denise and myself for a Q&A. And we're hoping uh, as much as possible to include uh, questions uh, from the chat as well. Uh, all the panelists have received the, the, uh, the questions in advance. So uh, we might throw a few curves at them, but by and large, uh, I think uh, they'd be quite prepared for a, a very, very robust discussion. So this and panel is about, apologies. Did I hear someone? Andrew, I just wanted to add, um, I know yesterday we had a flurry of inputs uh, through the chat function. I would like to encourage everybody, just so that all of our delegates have a chance to benefit from your inputs, if you could please include them uh, as an all panelists and all uh, attendees, uh, because I know the panelists were inundated with input, but I just felt badly that many of you weren't able to see that because it was simply sent to us uh, and we tried to embed it in the conversation. So if I could invite you all to share that with the entire conference delegation and panelist uh, group, we greatly appreciate that. Thanks, Andrew. Ah, thank you, Larissa. So uh, this session is about uh, inclusivity, sustainability, global access uh, to education, and it's about stimulating our thinking with respect to new models and new ways of uh, thinking about uh, internationalization of our universities and the role that international students play uh, in the university. It's also, I think, an opportunity for us to reflect about how we can make uh, what we have as a really incredible programs on many of our university campuses globally accessible to students uh, abroad and how we can rethink uh, what internationalization in the context of a, of a global pandemic looks like. Um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce our first two speakers. Uh, the first is Ashley Richard. Ashley serves as a National Indigenous Outreach and Partnership Development Lead for the Women Entrepreneurship Knowledge Hub. She is a proud Indigenous woman from Winnipeg with family from Pine Creek First Nations and Campbellville, Manitoba. Her spirit name is Forever Woman. Ashley's life purpose is to follow in the footsteps of her grandmother, Mary Richard, who is described as the love of her life. Ashley's career, both professional and volunteer, has spanned across many grassroots collectives, private sector firms, and nonprofit organizations. 
She holds a Bachelor of Commerce Honours from the University of Manitoba and is part of the Class of 2021 cohort for the Masters in Management, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program at Queen's University. As a survivor of sexual assault and having been homeless at a young age, Ashley is a public speaker and travels across Canada speaking about her journey and the importance of resilience, empathy, and self-acceptance. Ashley will be invited to speak in a few minutes. The second speaker is Andrew Gordon. Andrew is a social entrepreneur and CEO and founder of Diversity Abroad. With a passion for student success, global engagement, and social entrepreneurship, he founded Diversity Abroad in 2006 with a simple vision that the next generation of young people from historically marginalized backgrounds are equipped with the skills, experiences, and network to thrive in the 21st century interconnected world and in our globally diverse workforce. As an international advocate for student success through equitable access to global education, Andrew speaks and writes extensively on leveraging global education to support students' academic success, interpersonal growth, and career readiness. He consults colleges and universities, nonprofits, companies, and government agencies on developing, implementing, and monitoring diversity, equity, and inclusive practices, policies, and strategies in their global engagement operations. Again, Andrew will be invited to speak in a couple minutes. Now it's over to my colleague, Dr. Denise uh, O'Neill Green. Thank you, Amber, and good morning uh, to everyone or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, in addition to some of the thoughts that Amber tabled earlier, uh, we, we also want to continue that conversation that was started yesterday regarding issues of equity and social justice and human rights within the space of uh, international uh, education and what type of leadership needs to be brought to bear through universities, through governments and considerations of countries that don't have the same kinds of infrastructure and development related to international uh, education. And lastly, just considering uh, who is this really benefiting uh, in terms of the structures that we have in place right now. So as we continue this wonderful conversation, I have the pleasure of introducing our, our additional three panelists, uh, starting with Let's make sure I have it right here, CJ Tremblay. Uh, CJ is proudly one of the founding members and current vice president of the board of the Climate Action Network for International Educators. CJ has seven years of marketing strategy and stakeholder relations experience in the international education and language testing industry. During her career, she has worked for the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies, IDP Education, owner of IELTS, and most recently is leading the global marketing and instructional products team at Paragon Testing Enterprises as owner of the Canadian Academic English Language Test. CJ earned her global executive MBA from Georgetown University in Washington, DC in 2018, and has since completed several training courses in sustainability and social responsibility. Earlier this year, she was trained as a climate realty leader by VP Al Gore. Our next speaker will be Tariq Fancy, and Tariq is the founder of Rumi, an award-winning education technology nonprofit whose innovation, innovative solutions lower the barriers to learning for underserved communities in over 30 countries. Tariq's successful business career and unique decision to found Rumi has been chronicled in extensive case studies published by both Harvard Business School and in Seed Business School. 
prior to Rumi to re-led a successful career in finance beginning as a Palo Alto-based technology investment banker in the group that led the IPOs of Google, Amazon, and Cisco. In 2004, Tariq led early work to bring mobile phones into emerging markets as a leapfrog innovation. Back when the idea to go directly to mobile phones instead of landlines sounded far-fetched to many. Tariq sees a similar perfect storm of market forces enabling a pragmatic market-based solution to global education that will usher in another watershed moment in international development. He was born and raised in Canada to parents who immigrated from Kenya. And then our last speaker we have is Ankit Tripathki. And Ankit is an international student hailing from India. He is a fourth year student at Trent University majoring in, in environmental science and business administration at the Peterborough campus. He is a student organizer at his campus with the Trent International Students Association and Trent Central Students Association. He is also the international students representative at the Canadian Federation of Students National. In his role, he is working on ways to mobilize more international students in Canada's student movement and demand for better treatment from governments and educational institutions overall and to be included in a publicly funded post-secondary education model, OHIP and other public services. Turning it back to you, Amber. Thank you for those remarks and uh, introductions, Denise. So in order of uh, the following, uh, we'll have uh, Ashley, then Andrew, CJ Tariq, and Ankit speaking. So Ashley, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and I'm pleased to be invited to be part of this panel today. Uh, this discussion is really important to me, and the perspective that I'm hoping to bring today is one of personal experience. Um, as an Indigenous student, uh, I felt like I had a lot of similar experiences uh, to my international student uh, cohort at the University of Manitoba, where I completed my undergraduate degree. Uh, as mentioned in my bio briefly, I do have a story growing up that is, um, it's similar actually to a lot of Indigenous women and maybe more than you might think, um, being homeless at a young age, a survivor of sexual assault, um, dealing with family members who are battling drug addiction and alcoholism. All of these things um, shaped the way that I see and interact with the world. And in high school, I dropped out three times. I could not pay attention in school. There was just, I had such a tumultuous personal life that really kind of locking myself down at school was really challenging for me, which in turn made it harder for me to get into university because I didn't have all the prerequisites. Um, it was like by the time I fully decided to do a 180 and turn my life around, uh, my high school years were coming back to haunt me. And it was really um, at the, I owe a lot of my undergraduate success to a program that was specifically dedicated to helping Indigenous students uh, move through their undergraduate degree in business. Without them, I don't think I would have done it. And through them, I was actually able to take part in an international experience and study in Bordeaux, France. Um, so I'll share a little bit more about that as the panel progresses, but of course, happy to be here. Ashley, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a remarkable story that you compressed in a short uh, few minutes, uh, mm -hmm. but it's incredibly inspiring to all of us. Thank you so much. Uh, Andrew, over to you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, bonjour à tous. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, I'm Andrew Gordon, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of Diversity Abroad. And um, I really come to you from two perspectives, one, as a, a former student, uh, a student of, of color who studied abroad multiple times uh, and whose experience, uh, my experience really drove me to found an organization, Diversity Abroad, 
in, in 2006. Um, and um, we'll get into some of the details of that a little bit later on in our, in our discussion, but really the, the heart of our, our work um, you see here on the screen is our, is our vision um, that the next generation of young people from historically marginalized backgrounds are equipped with the skills, knowledge, and networks to thrive in the 21st century. Um, and so we believe in the power of global education uh, and its power to uh, impact students' success, academic, uh, interpersonal, and, and otherwise. And we work with um, 300 plus universities and organizations uh, around the world uh, to uh, support students, both in outbound and inbound mobility. And so as I talk about my, my comments later on, or as we're going throughout the, uh, the session, uh, I will say there are gonna, there's kind of four points that I will probably come back in, uh, to in at different points about why um, equity inclusion is so critical to the work we do in international education and cultural exchange. Um, one, global education is a high impact practice. We know it supports students' uh, persistence uh, to, to graduation and helps them in thriving um, while they're in school and, and also afterwards. Um, also, when we think of uh, equity inclusion in international education, it helps dismantle this two-tiered approach that we have to education. Um, we're doing a better job, I know, in the U.S. and in Canada in admitting uh, students from historically marginalized backgrounds to our universities, but those students aren't always successful. Um, we get them in, but they don't always have access or equitable access to all the opportunities that the quote-unquote traditional students do. And so when we think about global education and, and equity inclusion within, um, our work uh, helps in dismantling this two-tier system to education, ensuring that all of our students uh, have equitable access to these tremendous opportunities. Um, and when we support equity and, and educational opportunities, ultimately we're supporting access to opportunity, um, ed uh, educational opportunity, career opportunities, and, and otherwise, uh, and, and ensuring that all citizens from all communities have uh, equitable access to the opportunities that our societies have to offer. Uh, and then finally, when we look at promoting uh, equity and inclusion within global education, we also uh, promote um, communities or uh, climates of inclusion and belonging within the offices that we work uh, with our team members um, as, as a whole, which is something that's critical to our work. Uh, and so excited to be here to have this conversation uh, and share some of the perspectives that, um, that we've learned over the years. And I look forward to um, speaking uh, with the panel and uh, all of you in attendance. Andrew, thank you so much. That was great. Uh, CJ, over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, and thank you so much to CBIE for bringing this panel together. Um, building on yesterday's conversation, it was such a super important uh, discussion, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, as mentioned, I'm a founding member of the Climate Action Network for International Educators. Um, and, you know, I've been asked <laughs> time and again, like, why just climate action? Um, climate action is a very specific area of sustainability with climate action being a UN sustainable development goal. It's goal number 13, but it's one of 17. Um, but it is the only goal with a really short runway to drastically change. Um, we've, you know, the leading scientists are saying that we've got about a decade to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 45%. And so our work as a sector um, and as canny in this space is very narrow and specific in terms of scope of action, but in the grand scheme of sustainability, um, it has a very wide scope of impact. Um, you know, yesterday, Professor Walcott um, called attention to the issue that climate change disproportionately affects Black, and Indigenous, and people of color, um, and a group that also faces increased systemic barriers to education. And climate justice is foundational to any work uh, around climate action. And so here we are in this very specific intersection of climate action, racial justice, and international education. Um, and it's interesting because we know all these things to be true, these injustices to be true and the inequalities. Um, and we have operations that are driven by economic models that are not only not inclusive, um, but they're also unsustainable for our planet and its people. So how do we reconcile um, our work of creating, you know, we talked a lot about global citizens yesterday. So how do we reconcile our work of creating global citizens, which is vital to the work of solving big global issues with the carbon footprint of that work? How do we transform? It's, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, there's an opportunity for our sector to step up and do more in the face of the climate crisis. Um, you know, we hear from students who do not yet hold power um, and we don't really have a lot of time for them to ascend to that power before it's too late to change. And so we have a responsibility 
And what we hear from them, what we hear from those students time and again, is a call to rise and meet the moment. Um, it is a reminder that our sector holds a tremendous amount of power, both at an institutional level, but also political, financial, and social power. Um, so I'm super pleased to be here today and build on what we heard yesterday and specifically to discuss like rising the level of it, like raising the level of ambition across the sector on climate action and to work collaboratively to drive change. And we hear about like building back, um, but really rather than building back because normal wasn't really working for everyone. And how do we focus on the forward, the inclusive um, and the sustainable with actionable changes on climate? So yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, CJ, for that. So Tariq, you're on mute. Sorry for that. Thank you, Denise. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble sharing some slides, but I'm just gonna go through it verbally. I think it'd probably be easier anyway. Um, my, um, so my focus area is really uh, a little bit on zooming out and looking at education and learning through a, a wide lens of like, how do people learn today, forgetting any of the structures that we have in place and how is that being affected by technology? And the way I normally start that conversation of explaining what we're doing is actually talk about social media. Some of you may have seen a recent documentary called The Social Dilemma that is on Netflix. It is getting a lot of attention around the negative mental health effects of social media. There's a whole bunch of other ones, political instability and so on. But the most fascinating thing about, I think about social media is how they've managed to take so much of our time in the day. So the average, uh, Instagram users spend six and a half minutes per Instagram session. Um, that sounds like a short amount of time. It's kind of, you know, you're waiting for a panel to start or you're waiting for the bus or whatever in a few minutes. Uh, what's really amazing is how much time that adds up to. So the average person uses about two and a half hours of social media per day. Uh, in underserved communities, that's often higher. So the highest in the world is in the Philippines. It's nearly four hours a day. Um, and it's just comprised of a, of a really effective way of just taking little bits of time out that aggregate into something, something quite large. And, uh, and so when we've, we looked at the education space, we found that there was some opportunity lacking because a lot of what the space was focused on is a simple equation around quality. The quality of your learning drives impact and that's it. And that is true and it has been true historically if you focus on formal educational systems. So for example, if you are stuck in a classroom uh, and you're, there's a lecture going on, you know, the better the quality, the better the impact in terms of learning, because really it's a captive audience that can't leave, right? The, if you're seven minutes into a lecture and it's a really boring lecture, you probably can't walk out in the middle because you're stuck there from, you know, you either paid tuition or social or parental expectations or whatever. Um, and really where we think the world is going is a little bit more around quality and engagement drive impact, because the second that you move to a non-captive audience, as frankly, I think a lot of government ministries and other folks have figured out in the course of this year, you know, you're trying to access someone on this device and your competition is much higher because if your content is boring, someone closes it and opens a TikTok video, which is a, a you know, a chance that they don't really have if they're sitting in a classroom, presum presumably the teacher would catch them if they did it. Um, and so we've focused heavily on engagement that's led us towards micro learning, which means allowing people to learn in discrete insights um, that are five to seven minutes in length in a mobile first platform. And the reason that we're so excited about that is that first of all, the learner retention is about 22% higher just for the amount of time you spend um, doing it in this format. Uh, second and most obviously, of course, you get a lot more time that people can, can, can dedicate to it because it's sort of, you know, it meets their schedules. And we find that um, we, we're doing work in over 30 countries, as was mentioned, it's work for girls education in Afghanistan, it's work for, um, you know, with refugees and just sort of across the gamut. And we find that whether in rich countries or, or less rich countries, you tend to find that underserved communities have competing demands on their time and the easier you can make it. And frankly, the more fun for youth, the greater the impact that you get. So I'll just finish on that point and say that sort of the model we're working on is really micro learning and the, the, the bites, which are micro learning courses that we uh, create that are all on, you could see them today if you go to rumi.org, rumie.org. Uh, even on your phone, it's mobile first. The bytes are created by either volunteer experts that we vet. Um, oftentimes, companies create ones around job and life skills. 
and finally celebrity experts. So we just had Chris Hadfield create a Biden as sort of an avenue we're growing, kind of like a Wikipedia open and free learning, but all based around micro concepts that we think, um, and I'm happy to share, well, you know, are based on data that show that they really engage people better. And, and there's an avenue to think about from a digital perspective and where education is going. Thank you, Terry, for that. And so uh, our next speaker, Ankit. Thank you, Denise. Um, firstly, it's fantastic to hear from everybody. These are some great perspectives. I'm privileged to be here. I'm just 23 years old, so this is quite the crowd. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Ankit. My pronouns are he and him. I'm here from the Canadian Federation of Students, as you can see here. Um, which is the National Students' Union here in Canada, serving over 350,000 students. Uh, we're the biggest and the oldest uh, students' union, uh, currently representing students at provincial and national levels. Now, I'm here talking about international students with people who are obviously super experienced in this field. Um, what I hope to bring here today is sort of the other side of the table. Oftentimes, we are making decisions for people without having them in the room. Um, and I think that is what primarily hits home for me um, when it comes to making decisions for international students in post-secondary or any level of education, right? Um, my fellow people of color in this uh, panel, as well as in this room, know that oftentimes decisions are made for us without us being present in the room. Say hooray if you know, because <laughs> it's not that great, right? Um, same happens to students. So when we say inclusive, sustainable international education, we can work backwards. What do we mean by internationalization, right? Having international students on our campus is one way to do it, but also sending students and creating opportunities for students to leave campus and study everywhere else on the planet is also something that is super important. Me personally, I went to Barbados last fall as part of my program to uh, practice um, a course on environmental science. It's called um, the issues, and, uh, issues uh, and solutions to environmental problems in small island developing states. It is such a niche within environmental uh, and climate action. However, the more I read into it, I found that there is that much more urgency for something of that sort um, to be worked upon. And small island developing states are truly in a precarious condition. Similarly, they, the way small island developing nations are a small part of the global political and economic system, it makes, you can draw parallels with their condition in the world with the condition of international students in Canada. Small, but probably need quite a bit of attention because the things are not going well. During this pandemic, we've been constantly left out by several levels of support, quite simply because of our passports. Um, I didn't choose to be born anywhere else, um, but I did choose to come here. Yet the way I'm supported is exactly the opposite. The place I choose to be does not support me and the place I'm from does not have the ability to support me. So how do I access support as an immigrant in this country on a temporary resident visa? That's what my role in the CFS is entirely about, about expanding the democratic participation of international students in a country where we can't vote because democracy doesn't end at voting, it begins there. And there's a lot more to democracy beyond voting. So when we say inclusivity, I'll, in this introduction, just address inclusivity, um, anybody here from post-secondary in uh, Canada, I want you to ask yourself how many of your board of governors have an international student? Take two seconds. Or maybe an indigenous student. What about a person of color? Here at Trent, we just got our first person of color, permanent board of governor person who's uh, our new uh, provost, Michael Khan from University of Windsor is the first black or brown person to be present on the board of governor of Trent University. It's deplorable that it took 2020, 65 years of this university functioning for this moment to come. But we're here, right? Progress is very slow, but we're getting there. And hopefully throughout the rest of this conversation, I'm able to talk to you folks about democratic development of international students in Canada within your post-secondary education institutions and beyond. Looking forward to it. So we really wanna thank everyone for uh, their opening remarks. It, it will certainly continue the conversation from yesterday and has, has put on the map some of these very core issues around sustainability, 
What does it mean to be inclusive and how can technology uh, really get us there along with the different uh, experiences of being indigenous and so forth. So I'll turn it over to Amber to kick us off with the first question. Uh, thank you, Denise, and to the panelists again, thank you so much for your really rich and uh, textured uh, opening remarks. The first question I would pose uh, to all of you, and I'd ask you to keep your answers as succinct as possible, please, so that we can get to more, more questions and questions from the audiences as well. Uh, the question I'm going to ask is, how do we develop a new model of inclusive equitable internationalization that goes beyond seeing international students uh, as sources of revenue and makes education truly more global and globally uh, accessible. Open to um, uh, anyone to start to kick off the discussion. I'd love to hear from Ankit on this, but one idea I have is not charging international students an exorbitant amount of tuition. Uh, good suggestion. Uh, uh, Ankit, over to you and then I'll turn to Tariq. Sounds great, fantastic. Yes, Ashley, you're absolutely right. <laughs> um, not charging us exorbitant amount of fees and I'm going to push it another step further, and you're welcome to label me radical. It's all good. I've heard it too many times. But I'm talking free post-secondary education. Yeah, that, that hits sometimes. <laughs> um, so free post-secondary education, why and how? Um, oftentimes, can, or at least in Canada, we have the tendency of comparing ourselves to the United States. I don't think that's the right way to do it. The United States has a very different set of problems, and we actually tend to share far more parallels in our economic and social and political uh, ways with Europe. And comparing ourselves to Europe might actually prove quite productive. Now, in Europe, had I known earlier, I would have applied that way, because for international students in Europe, post-secondary education is free right? It's not new. It's not radical. It's been done and it can be done again. Um, that's one way of doing it because, but the way from getting where we are right now, all the way to there is a long and arduous process because we come up against rhetoric, which is along the lines of why should our tax dollars pay for somebody else? Why do we want more immigrants in our country? We face more xenophobia, more racism, more ways of just, you know, obstructions. And that's when those barriers become evident when you're like, why can't I have the specific public service? Right? It's about investing in new citizens, and which is why democratic participation is important. The only way international students will get included in a public um, education model in Canada is first if Canada has a public education model, which is currently not really there. Right? Like Canadians get free post, uh, free education all the way up to grade twelve through public through fantastic public schools, by the way, and then after that, the the, the cost of continuing education just spikes. And in Ontario, we have the lowest per student uh, funding in the whole country. So it only means that, and Anwar, you would know this, right? <laughs> Students in Ontario have to pay a lot more than anywhere else in the country because we just, because the government in Ontario doesn't fund per students quite as well. So including international students in that sort of a model, I'm just talking about Ontario, is it sounds like a very long process. So how do we get there? We start with picking apart the arguments that are given to us, and they're mostly financial, right? We hear that international students can't be included because it's an expensive program to run if we give everybody post-secondary education. The solution to this problem is actually pretty simple. OSAP, as a model, takes so much money to run that if we just put the money we spend towards administering OSAP towards directly funding students, Ontario would spend not an additional dollar than it already does, on funding every student that is already in post-secondary, including international students. That's one solution, but uh, I'm not gonna take up any more space. Uh, I'll let other speakers speak. That was uh, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Ankit. Uh, Tariq, CJ, and then Andrew. Uh, so I'll, uh, I would say, my, so my perspective on a personal level is that I'm a Canadian who studied at four universities um, on four different countries, all outside Canada, and the UK, US, France, and Singapore. And so uh, I try to contrast sort of my experiences with what, what's, what happens in Canada. And I, I'd say, I mean, those were also some years ago, but I'd say sort of two things. One, I think um, 
there's a question around the economics that I, I honestly don't know the answer to because my sense is that as much as I think it's morally desirable for us to make education free for everyone, I don't, there's certainly a bunch of people crunching numbers in the background, understanding that you know doing that would blow a hole in the, in the budget that um, is going to have to be sold somehow, whether it's you know justifying taxpayers or other things. And I, I might suspect that governments in the next few years are not going to be looking to spend more money given the amount of debt that's getting incurred right now. So uh, there's a desirable avenue there, uh, but I just don't know the reality of, of what's possible. But but I would say that even within the economics as they're presented now, um, you know, between what it is now and free, it is a, there's a lot of space, number one. Number two, uh, whatever it is the, the economics are, I don't see any particular reason why international students would not be better represented to, to Ankit's point. I mean, if they're an important constituency and particularly from an economic perspective, then it stands to reason that, um, you know, as universities and Canadian organizations benefit from their them coming in um, and the taxpayers do frankly over the long term because if it's a, it's a, it's a route to skilled immigration and, and, and integration, um, they should at a minimum have more representation in what they're getting. Uh, and I would add that, you know, that's sort of part of a sense that I, I get that maybe, maybe they're taken for granted, right? Um, and, you know, the other thing I'd say is that, you know, the experience that they have on some level, you want them to come and feel the Canadian experience because that's what they're coming for. On the other hand, it's a bit lazy to just give them that and say, you know, take this and we'll help you with a bit of visa paperwork. And that's kind of it. Um, you know, you want to actually have things that are, that are designed for them um, and designed for their experience, whether it's, you know, things around the cultural immersion and, and adapting, or it's, I would say also digital tools that allow them to, you know, be able to get an experience that um, uh, that they're that they're paying disproportionately for, but probably don't receive as well as they could. And I think if some of those things had been thought about earlier, probably there would have been better preparation for, you know, what's happened this year. Yeah, yeah it's super interesting. Um, and you know, in the context of when we talk about climate action and changing behaviors operationally, we come up against these. Um, barriers where we, you know, when we talk to people, people want to change. People are like, yes, of course I care about the planet and children and sort of the disproportional effect that it has on sort of the global south. But um, my, you know, KPIs or our revenues are our metrics for success. And so until we have these metrics for success that account for um, maybe everything, not just sort of the revenue, but take into account the costs, um, that is where you sort of see that inclusivity and you're still looking at student, international students as a source of revenue. And that transformation, you know, it does have to come from the top and Ankit mentioned sort of the, the, dem the democracy in action. And we all have agency as individuals, as departments, as institutions, service providers, and agencies right like um so policy changes will come in response to the groundswell of support so while change does need to come from the top it, it can be pushed along by individuals at all levels within an organization um or an institution moving forward together how um how we go ahead and do that and sort of the economics like Tarek said I was like there are sort of bean counters on the other end that I will defer to and I think that um, but we do have agency and pushing those discussions further in the institutions where we operate. Thank you, CJ. Andrew? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think history tells us anytime human beings are treated as commodities, it doesn't turn out well. Um, so if we look at international students simply as a commodity, um, I think we see how that's uh, impacted in too many international students on too many campuses all over the world. Um, and so again, I, I, I'm not going to be one to say whether um, fees should be co completely waived or not. I know different countries have different ways of, of, of doing that. But I think the point being, and I think uh, and, and Kik, you kind of hit on this, is that when our international students come in, are we treating them as second class citizens? Um, are we treating them as different? Um, you know, our international students, how are they different from our domestic students? They just happen to be born somewhere else. Um, so how are we ensuring that our international students are supported uh, in a holistic, inclusive way um, that ultimately supports their success? They're coming to campus to get an education, um, to achieve their academic career and life goals. 
Um, how are we helping them do that uh, and not uh, essentially discriminating against them as far as the kind of services they have access to simply based on the, the passports they have. And that has to be systemic um, from the point of recruitment through students being on campus and, and graduating and beyond. And so what you mentioned, uh, Andrew, to me is something that can be applied to domestic students as well, right? So in, in thinking about what everyone has said, uh, we're really pushing towards the how and how can we really reposition international education to further advance through our work of sustainability and equity, diversity, and inclusion. I mean, that, that is essentially where we're trying to go here. How can we shift, <laughs> turn that big ocean liner so that we can begin to move in, in that direction of bringing together sustainability uh, technology in EDI? And I, I will actually kick it back to you, Andrew, to start us off with that. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, so, what are our goals? So, you know, the thing is with with uh, you know diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I'll say maybe to the extent as well sustainability. Um, it has been sufficient just for us to say we support this, we're passionate about it, but there's no actual real goals. Um, what do we have goals around? We have goals around tuition revenue. We have goals around enrollment. We have goals and study broad about how many students we're sending out. So, those are very specific goals and very specific targets that we know that we're trying to reach, and that's. The premise of what our field has been about has been about quantity. How many students are we sending out? How many students are we bringing in? And so on and so forth. Well, if we reorient the goals to say, well, our goal is really about helping our students be successful. Um, so what does that look like? Um, but what does that look like from an outbound mobility standpoint? What does that look like from an inbound mobility standpoint? What does that mean for students that don't have the ability to go out at all, but still need access to a high quality global education in the 21st century. Um, so those outcomes being really what the focus is and less so just the numbers of us, you know, patting ourselves on the back and saying, hey, we sent X more numbers, X more number of students out every year, or we brought in X number of more number of international students. Uh, so really changing, I think, reorienting, reorienting what our goals are, and then that's what our targets will be. Thank you for that, reorienting our goals. Ashley, what what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I guess uh, following Andrew and reorienting goals also, <laughs> it's important um, to have clarity around what the EDI goals are. Um, for example, if a university has a zero tolerance policy, what does that really mean and how is that enforced? Um, even just in my master's cohort this year, um, there was a really unfortunate situation that happened in our cohort Slack. Um, and it raised the question, well, if this is allowed to happen, like what, what, is, what is zero tolerance? Um, and my experience, even in my undergrad, um, it, really, it really affected me negatively. Um, the comments that I would get for being an indigenous student, people would ask if I was there for free or if I got to come to university on a free ride, people felt like um, I didn't deserve to be there as much as they did. Um, I did pay for my university as well. That is just a myth. And, but having to put up with these comments really just hindered my ability. I just felt like I wasn't welcome at times. And I think if there was a more concerted effort into really actually promoting equity, diversity and inclusion in the school as a whole, I might not have had to face that. Um, in a recent meeting that I had they did uh, implement um, an EDI committee and speaking with students now, their experience is much different than mine. So I think progress is being made at least. Thank you so much for sharing that. And CJ, what are your reflections? Yeah, so, you know, and thanks Ashley for sharing your personal perspective. That's um, super powerful. And when we talk about, uh, you know, Andrew talks about talked about goals, and I, I relate to that so hard because it's like, what are we working toward if we don't have a, a target? And so you talk about like the intersection of technology, sustainability, and EDI, and how do we set our targets, at least from a carbon emission standpoint, to have a 
leverage those sort of technologies and making sure that we're not contributing um, and doing everything that we can to protect uh, the climate and protect the sort of lives and environment of the people that it's negatively affecting. And so when we talk about those goals, you're right, we hear a lot about sort of the revenue targets, the diversification targets, and we no one's ever been like, yeah, I, I can't go past my carbon budget, or I, I do have to reduce our carbon emissions by a certain amount. We're not having those conversations. People are, we're talking about it, and to Ashley's point, like, progress is being made. The fact that this conversation is happening at this high level is a good first step, but it's like, what is the next step and who can push those changes forward? And how do we leverage the technology in an inclusive way? Because technology and internet are, are not equally um, accessible to everyone, but how do we sort of leverage those technologies where we can in our work right now to and set our goals accordingly. Thank you, Tariq. The only thing I would add, um, uh, and I, I thought the other panelist comments were really interesting, so I'll just summarize a little bit is that, you know, in my experience, I've worked on the for profit side and turned around companies and nonprofit side. I've always found that organizations tend to move based on a few key metrics. And unless those metrics are managed, they don't end up, they end up being things that are discussed, but never actually implemented in any meaningful way. Uh, and that's for-profit companies. You know, you just sort of see that they're going to move based on a few things and their divisions and their P&L and their budgets and their financial and legal incentives and everything are built to drive towards those. And I think it's very true that unless those things are measured uh, concretely uh, and managed against, um, they end up just being sort of things that people talk about as nice to haves and they don't, they don't drive much. And I think that everything I'm hearing, I would agree with other panels. It, these things need to be concrete in order to actually, uh, you know, flow through into the experience students will have. Thank you for that. Ankit? Yes, fantastic. I, lo I love the perspectives that have been brought. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Andrew, Ashley, and Tarek. I'm going to take a different approach to come to the same conclusion. Um, CJ mentioned that the people who are affected most by the impacts of climate change or extreme climate events are also people who are typically identified as Black, Indigenous, or people of color, also people who you would find, also women, also people who you would find in the lower uh, class of society, if you will, working class or lower. Um, and who are the people that are most commonly unrepresented in different levels of decision-making? It happens to be this is the same people, right? In an international scale, that means that a lot of the students that are coming to study in post-secondary educations in Canada are also people, as a collective people, are also the least represented in several levels of decision-making bodies across the world and more so in the global North than in the global South. So how do we combat that? And the way to combat it is absolutely within organizations. You folks are correct. Change your metrics because everything we're living right now is a social construct. It's things that we discuss in first year sociology if anyone ever takes them, right? Um, it's, it's, it's all made up, <laughs> okay? Change the metrics, you'll change the system, you'll change the game, and therefore the result will be what we need desired, correct? The other way to change the metrics is actually asking, like, how do you develop these new metrics? Is actually, you can't do that without consulting with the people that you're hoping to help. You can't help a poor person without talking to said poor person. You can't help a person of color without talking to a person of color. A group of white people inside a closed room setting cannot make proper decisions that make sense for people of color. The same way, if we're trying, Post-secondary education institutions in Canada, if we are able to develop more democratically, to allow international students to participate, not only, well, starting with our board of governors and decision-making bodies on our campus, allowing that to extrapolate and expand further. Like in my case, I was first involved nowhere, but like in random students' unions and like clubs on campus. Then I made my way to the students' union and kept climbing that ladder to be where I am right now. And I'm currently organizing a side by side with this panel on an international level called the Global Student Forum, which is currently in the making, right? It, uh, I felt empowered because I knew to people who said that democratic participation is important. I heard that advice, I went that path and I am here now today. 
But I also see so many international students who don't get that visibility, who don't even see these options because we come here with one goal in mind, graduate, get a job, get your permanent residency. That's the three-step plan when you come to Canada. And don't let any politician tell you that most of us leave. If international students are leaving Canada, it's not because we want to leave, it's because there's fewer ways for us to stay. If we empower international students early on, then when international students become permanent residents and citizens, then we will not just be passive citizens that are afraid of the politics of this country that accepted us, but rather be active citizens that hold politicians to account even before we become citizens. Me here, I'm talking to all of you as an equal because I believe myself to have the same amount of impact in this country as any of you. When I'm not here anymore, if I'm not here anymore, then that would be a completely different conversation. But I'm here right now. And inclusion of international students in all levels of decision making will help develop these metrics that we need changed, right? And on the other, on the flip end of things, even if an international student like myself leaves, I'm leaving with a great set of abilities, skills, and thought processes that will allow me to bring this knowledge to the global south and participate there democratically to you know further the goals of sustainability. I'm from India. We're like the third or fourth largest emitter in the world, right? So me going back and working on sustainability would help India, but it would also help Canada because I learned my skills here. So there is, we talk about at the international level, how can the global north support the global south in this fight against climate change? Well, access to post-secondary would be a huge one. And not because you want us to stay, but maybe because you want, to, uh, want us to go back home and do this work there. Because brain drain won't help the south. I'm going to just cut you off because of, uh, I'm conscious of time. And I'm going to slightly depart from my script and put my... Um, my co-chair uh, uh, on the spot, because there have been a number of really interesting questions and comments that have come from uh, participants and, uh, and panelists. So to my co-chair, who is uh, our Vice President Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, some of the comments uh, uh, in the chat have been around EDI goals. How do we uh, set those goals? What should those goals look like? How do we tie them to uh, key performance indicators? And what does EDI in the context of internationalization look like? So I'm putting my, my, my co-chair on the spot, and then I will ask each of you to, to think about that and give a, a 30 second uh, reflection with final comments uh, as well, and I'll turn to each of you individually. So first panelist will be my co-chair. Uh, I don't know why you're doing that, Amber. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I will just echo what our other uh, very ma uh, magnificent panelists have said uh, regarding incentives, key performance indicators. Usually, as actually Ashley mentioned, there is a lot of talk, but it needs to be made more concrete. And concrete in terms of what our leaders uh, particular goals and metrics are in terms of their own responsibilities and also organizations need to set their own key performance indicators related to equity, diversity, and inclusion and make that very real instead of a very theoretical, nice to have concept, uh, but something that people can feel on the ground. And that goes to the point made by UNKIT related to representation uh, among faculty, staff, students. It's in relationship to issues of access and who has access to power and who has the ability to bring about change. So I'll just leave it at that and kick it back to our panelists. Uh, thank you, Denise. And now you know why she's our VP uh, Equity, Diversity, and Community Inclusion. So I will uh, ask, uh, uh, based on what I see on my screen, I'll ask Andrew to go next and uh, also include in your uh, comments a final wrap up uh, set of comments, Andrew. Yeah, so um, uh, internally we have, uh, we, I say, kind of the four A's that we use um, it's awareness, uh, accountability, uh, our awareness assessment, accountability, and action. 
Um, and that's a circular that continues on and on and on. We'll never be done with EDI work. Um, this is the work of human beings. Um, and there's a lot of work for us to do internally. Um, there's a lot of work for us to do within the structures that we're, that we're working in, but uh, we'll just focus back on what was, was mentioned earlier by several of our panelists. If there are no goals there, we won't be successful. Just saying that we feel good about it, just saying we support diversity, inclusion, and so on and so forth. Like that playbook we've tried for a very long time, we've not been successful. So there had to be very, very specific goals. Another thing I saw in one of the comments is questions I want to I want to know. And someone was asking about the difference between uh, EDI and anti-racism and, and anti-colonialism. And that, to be very clear, those are very distinct things. Um, we've done a lot of EDI work over the years and have completely ignored racism. And I'm, I'm talking talk about specifically, I'm talking about within the US. Uh, race is like that third rail issue that no one wants to talk about. Um, you can talk about other aspects of diversity inclusion and think you're good because you don't really want to talk about race. So we have to be able to have conversations about race, how race uh, impacts the, the systems that we're, that we're in. Systemic racism is a thing, it exists, it's real. Um, and that impacts how we uh, execute our work with our international students, with our domestic students um, as, as well. And so when we're thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, with broadly within international education, if international education is going to be uh, a viable part of the higher education ecosystem, uh, EDI has to be at the center of the work that we're doing. Thank you so much. Uh, CJ. Sure, and sort of on sort of building on what Andrew says, like climate justice is, like I said earlier, the foundation of any work on climate action. And those metrics on climate action and those goals in international, they're, they're missing right now. The goals aren't there and institutions and organizations aren't really sure where to start. We're just starting to have this conversation we don't even really know the baselines. There was research that came out earlier this year that estimated that in 2019, emissions from student mobility um, were approximately equivalent to that of a medium-sized country like Croatia. So, and that doesn't even account for emissions from operations like recruitment, conferences, meetings, faculty exchanges, and flying is one of the most emissions intensive activities humans can undertake. And for many of us in international, edu like travel is part and parcel of our day-to-day -day work. We talk about our like airline statuses and that is a part of our identity, the travel. And for, you know, we move pe students usually by flying, you know, back and forth and back again. And so, you know, COVID has changed the way that we work um, and, you know, it's transformed our operations with, um, in some cases, not all, but in some parts, it's transformed our operations with limited impact to results, right? So how do we learn from that, build from that? And if it is the case that what we learned from COVID, it may not always be necessary to fly, then, you know, in the face of a climate crisis, in those cases, it becomes necessary not to fly. And so, making sure that we're building our operations and those goals for the future um, with climate justice at the core is really um, connecting all the work um, that we're doing from a equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racist standpoint to our work um, in international operations. Thank you so much, CJ. Uh, Ashley. Uh, thank you. Um... Echoing everyone's closing remarks, um, really, if I can leave you with anything today, it is about remembering to be concrete versus conceptual because it really is not enough to sit around the table and aspire um, to not be ignorant or racist. Like Andrew said, that's been tried in the past and it hasn't worked. I mean, we're having this conversation today. And the reason that is, is because you may not know your own implicit biases and systemic and institutional racism exists because of policies that were created in the past and influence the way we behave and act today. And those things need to be addressed. So Ankit as well, you know, making sure seats at the table. Um, we're beyond the point of saying that you couldn't find anybody. There are tons of BIPOC people who are ready to be invited to the table. Um, and if you just take the initial step in looking, um, guaranteed you will find someone with the expertise. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ashley. Uh, Ankit, uh, closing remarks from you. Thank you. Yes, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. I'm just going to get provide you with a solution. Um, we hear the statement that um, education is the great equalizer. If we look carefully, there is an asterisk and fine print which says for those who can afford it. I'm saying get rid of the asterisk and you've already solved a huge chunk of the problem. Once more parts of the population have access to um, education, from there, we can continue building forward the way we are right now. Thanks. Great, excellent. Uh, Tariq. Thank you. Um, I, I'll just finish with two points, actually building off other what other panelists said. Uh, the first one is, you know, I, I really I would want I want to emphasize what what Andrew said about the importance of talking about race, uh, and the importance of making these things concrete. Because in my experience, the less concrete they are, and the more they are sort of vague pronouncements of like this is important, the less that they actually, you know, come the result in something that actually moves a needle. And I would also say that, you know, the problem with vague pronouncements is that it doesn't actually look, they don't look closely at where you need to incisively focus on diversity and inclusion. I mean, I'm not an expert on it, but in the last 20 years, I look at, you know, a, 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 there's a bunch of think, trends that have gone the right direction around, around gender and other things that have progressed well, they still have a ways to go, but they're going in the right direction. And I think issues on race have been going in the wrong direction in the last 20 years. Uh, and I think to myself personally, I did my undergrad in the US four years ago, there was a president elected who tried to ban me from the country. Um, and you know, the truth is that the majority of, of white women in the country actually voted for him. And, you know, and people say, oh, it's Trump, it's Trump. But the reality is, you know, he won an election with votes from the electorate. I mean, these are things that we have to think about because they must be trickling through into every other interaction that people have, whether it's in a store, whether it's in a classroom or anything else. And I worry that Sometimes in diversity and inclusion, we're not, um, it's used in such a blunt way that we're not actually focused really on the trends and the direction of, of where things are going. And, and some of them are unfortunately have been going in the wrong direction quite a bit. Uh, the last thing I'd say on top of that, I'm um, just building a little bit on, on CJ said, I think, um, I, I think that we really do need to think uh, again, a little bit about, um, about how we can use technology in effective ways to, build a solution that requires less travel, doesn't require no travel, but requires less travel and lean into it a little bit. And my sense with um, someone, I think Denise referenced a Titanic or, or, or a big ship or tanker or something. And you know, the idea is big institutions take a while to change, but I would stress that, you know, somewhere there needs to be experimentation. And if this current year and everything's happened is not that jolt to try new things, and I'm not sure what would be because Otherwise, it's things tend to be complacent, and you know, people say, "Well, this works, so why why would we change it?" And I think now is really a time to to try changing things and experimenting, because if not now, then I'm not sure if 2020 hasn't convinced people what what really would. Great, a heartfelt thanks to all of you for your great insights. I'm always saddened when uh, uh, when fabulous panels and amazing panelists uh, and their insights have to come to a close. So. Uh, on that note, I will, uh, I'll say again, a uh, huge thank you to all of you for your great insights. It's been a very stimulating panel. I'll turn it to Denise to say a few closing remarks and then we'll both turn it over to Larissa. I also want to give my thanks to the panelists. You've really brought out some very important concepts and topics that many people don't want to talk about. And that is really the first step to bring it to the conversation, make it real so that we can actually make the change that needs to happen. So thank you again for your insights and contributing today. And we'll kick it back to you, Larissa. Thank you so much, Denise and, and Anver and, and each and every one of our panelists.